Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Junior Doan, and welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. With me today is the most marvelous photographer, Judy Glickman Lauder, whose work is in 150 museums. Currently, she has a book out, On the Holocaust, Beyond the Shadows, and in this book, she not only photographs some of the worst concentration camps and experiences, but the beauty and the honor and the bravery of the Danes who went to evacuate their Jews to Sweden during World War II. So Judy, welcome, let's start. Let's start. Which, uh, which page? I will Ooh. say that she also uses infrared photography, so you're gonna be yeah. learning something she probably haven't known much about. Thank you, Junia. I love thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to have to start on such a deep and sad subject. Uh, this is kind of a story of my journey uh, into the areas of the Holocaust and then also into the areas of Denmark where the Danes, occupied by Nazi Germany, were able to save their Jews, rose together and were able to save their Jewish population. It kind of started with the Wannsee Conference outside of Berlin, where Himmler, Heydrich, and many of the top Nazi officials met to decide that it wasn't just imprisoning Jews or exporting Jews. It was going to be the final solution. Uh, each and every Jew, from a newborn to the oldest, frailest, uh, needed to be put to death. And uh, the word genocide began, was coined, I think, at the Nuremberg trials about the man's inhumanity to man. But sadly, it didn't start with World War II, and it is still going on today. And um, so this is kind of a record of what went on and also a record that man can make a difference. And uh, the Danes rose to great heights and were able to successfully save their Jewish population. Read that, that's quite... I will read this. This is a photograph of the trains, which were central. This is a quote from the workers um, from the Shoah, the movie Shoah. They waited, they wept, they asked for water, they died. This just speaks of the Holocaust. This is the uh, railroad crossing, Treblinka. The train tracks that I just showed you went from the Warsaw Ghetto right straight to Treblinka, which was a straight extermination camp. Again, the trains, this is in Teresian shot. This is Bahusova's train station near Prague. Exterior Auschwitz here, the infrared film is kind of concentrating on the weeds that have grown up. Uh, and you just see the whole Was effect of the buildings. Stories, yeah, yeah, those are two stories. And probably barracks. And this is the guard house, or what is yeah, that? Yeah, the guard towers that were everywhere, the barbed wire, the curved uh, fences. Kind of sad, one camp that I was at, Majdanek, which is outside of the city of Lublin in Poland. Uh, the camp is there with the barbed wire and the fences and so on. The city has grown, and right next to this camp are apartment buildings with balconies, with barbecues, etc. And what do they overlook? They overlook Majdanek. It, um, it what do you shows, make of that? Well, it kind of shows that um, anti-Semitism is still alive and well. 
but uh, uh, what do you make of it? I mean, it's just total in non-human. I mean, it's just crazy. What do it's you make of it? Bar I think it's a barbaric um, uh, um, response in the face of real pain of other human beings instead of saying, I have to respect, right. this was a really bad thing. Right. Uh, they just ignored that it was Right, they bad, liked the abortment, or maybe they were dishonoring. Who knows what goes through people's minds? They have no idea. But it is. But it's quite tragic, because Lublin was a whole center of Judaism, of scholarship, spiritual center, etc. And then it became a ghetto, and then all the people in the ghetto just went right into the camp. And to, so today, there's like no Jews there. This is a reverse print, a negative print. Uh, this is also at Majdanek, the huge chimney, barbed wire, and so on. The Arbeit Makfrei, which is an example of the deception. Work shall make you free. People thought they were going there for maybe the duration of the war, or for a short duration, and then they would be free to go back to their homes the barracks, the cells, and so on. I don't want to go through the whole book, but Oh, let's please see. do. <laughs> uh, now, this yes, is... Yes, let's talk about some of those I, things. I, this is an example of a dissection, two, two dissection tables. This one is in Theresienstadt. I photographed them in maybe three or four different camps. It was just, it just shows the total uh, inhumanity uh, First, a prisoner was shaved and no name, just given a number. And tattooed on. Yeah, tattooed on. And, uh, and then even after death, they're just, bodies are brought in and they're examined. Was there a gold filling that they could get? Was there something that they could use, a hidden jewel, an intimate part of the body or something? And it's like, um, frightening and a disaster. Uh, and then we go to Denmark, which was like a breath of fresh air, and the Danish rescue, a lot of fishermen. This is Jens Moller. He was a teenager. It was his father's herring boat. And uh, they went back and forth over the oar sound at night. Gestapo was everywhere. He risked his life and his livelihood this is a quote from Elie Wiesel, and he said, in those times, one climbed to the summit of humanity by simply remaining human. I have lots of fishermen that I've photographed. Please, I have lots show of us people. some. <laughs> no, I like the stories. Okay, I've read the okay, book. It was okay, very okay, moving. here's the stories. This is Gilalai. This is a fishing village, probably 20 miles north of Copenhagen. 1,200 people were rescued from there, from Gilalai, uh, over the Orr Sound into Sweden. Um, but before their rescue, they all had to be, they had to get there, and they had to be hidden somewhere until there were boats that were available. And all of it was very, very scary. In Gilalai, there is a mariner's church, and in the attic of that church, there were about 64 people that could not get on a boat that night. Uh, they felt the Gestapo was coming, so they all sought a quick place to hide, and they ran into the church and were in the attic, but people saw them, and uh, they were all captured, and they went to Theresienstadt. This is a writer, Abraham uh, Abrahamovitz, and he uh, wrote Gilalai 43, he uh, was not a survivor. He was an, almost like an infant. Uh, he lived for the, uh, his family got him into Sweden and he lived there during the war, came back and wrote a whole play about what must have been going on in their minds that whole night because they knew that they had been seen. The forest where people were hidden, also scary. They didn't know if people were coming. Is it Gestapo looking for people, or is it somebody coming to tell them a boat was Excuse available? Me. What, this what is did, kind Senor. of camera did you use? This is a probably infrared film. It just gives it, the lights become more glowy, 
And do the uh, edges get softer? Or yeah, it's just yeah, it's kind of grainy, and uh, the edges do get softer. Exactly. Mystical. Yeah, that's the word I'm thinking of. Mystical. Yeah. Um, this is a cemetery in Denmark that shows how many people were buried there. Resistance people. Um, how do they show it? They what? How do they show it? Oh, well, it's a memorial to all um, those who died, and it is placed at a place where I think, uh, how many resistance graves who died? 106 executed resistance fighters are buried right here, the graves of Danes who died, and, uh, and so on. Ooh. This is called the Dark Wave. Uh, I'm on an actual fishing boat from World War II with fishermen. This is the Nakahovit Lighthouse that very was perched small. up there. Where did yeah, you very see small. that? How would they well, see it? Well, it's interesting. The light went straight out, and the fishermen were very proud. Uh, they were laughing because they felt they went under the Gestapo's nose. They, they could go real close to the coast because these were smaller boats, and they could go right under the light and get on their way to Sweden. So this, they had Gestapo boats here to... to oh, the Gestapo were all over the place, yeah. And uh, all over the Oar Sound. Um, this talks about death and the memorials. Uh, this is the old Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. This is a sculpture of Jan Korczak, who was ran an orphanage he was in uh, Warsaw. He was quite a prominent pediatrician, had radio talks. He could have gotten out, uh, uh, but he chose to stay with his children and they were all, uh, they all died at Treblinka. Uh, the broken gravestones, they destroyed uh, cemeteries and then they had the audacity to use those stones to build a wall around something or another. This is in Warsaw. What's this about? This is actually a poster, Child of Theresienstadt, that is in the Old Jewish Cemetery in Prague and it's just a very haunting image. Mm -hmm. You know the Mass eyes grade. of the Danes are so yeah. I'm very drawn to people's eyes. Yeah. And yeah. there's a, yeah. a warmth or decency there's or a decency. character. Or there is totally a decency. Um, let me just go back. Um, this was a present day pastor at the Trinity Church, which saved all the Torah scrolls and so on from the big synagogue. Uh, the Crystal God Synagogue. That is which beautiful. Is, isn't it beautiful? Classic, classic. Uh, right in Copenhagen, they thought that the Nazis were going to blow it up, and so they took all... The detail. In, yeah, yeah, the detail is gorgeous. There was some story around that. They had a sneak in or something. They and did, and I photographed the guy who snuck the... Uh, I don't know if it's in the book. It might be. Resistance, early resistance leader, Frode Jakobsen, Karen Lee Polson. She was on bicycles. She was a teenager at the time, taking one person at a time to a boat. Dr. Uh, Oli Secker, he was a medical student in the Bischoberg Hospital, and where they hid in the bowels of the hospital. They hid, gave people fake names, fake illnesses, charts, and so on and then mm. got them out, even with a fake funeral procession, huh. got them out to uh, a northern village uh, where they were able to get on boats. Boy, inventive and, and risk takers. Oh yeah, totally, 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 totally. He commandeered about 80 taxis and got people in cabs and got them out. Uh, journalist, survivor. What did he do? Herbert? Yes. He was the head of the Politiken, which is like our, the big newspaper in Copenhagen, sort of like the New York Times or whatever. And a journalist, a survivor, he tells his whole story in the book. Uh, he was like a teenager uh, mm -hmm. when they were able to escape. And uh, he was very, very strong, very relevant in 
finding people for me, uh, giving them, giving me contact information, and telling me a little bit of their story so that um, I knew who I was photographing and all of that. Uh, this is the gate of that big synagogue. Oh. Sven Erik Osterholm. And he was instrumental in safeguarding religious texts of the main synagogue in Copenhagen under the eyes of the Germans. He and his friend broke into the synagogue early one morning and so on and so on. And the, uh, the, the boy, a man on the yes. left? He was very involved in intelligence, went on to have diplomatic roles, and um, uh, I think he had a, uh, a lot to do with Israel and with England and with everything. Um, and he tells his story. Hmm. And this is interesting. He is a Danish policeman. In Denmark, the police did not turn on in most countries, uh, the police sort of joined right in and herded the Jews and so on. Not so in Denmark, and he was in the a resistance group called the Elsinore Sewing Circle <laughs> in Elsinore, but he got caught. Uh, the Gestapo came while he was trying to get people on a boat, shot him, wounded him in the leg, bleeding to death. Tove Wanberg is a nurse. She found him, got him, smuggled him into the hospital, saved his life, and uh, I photographed them quite a bit together. And this way, it was just you know quite a story. She was in Theresienstadt, uh, Birgit Krasnik, uh, fisherman. As a child, her father was arrested, and the mother mistakenly, took the three children to the police station to find out what they can do about the father, and they arrested them all, and oh. they all went to Theresienstadt. But they survived. And, and this is Herbert Pundik's wife, Seuss, who also tells her story how her family were able to get across. And it was very tough because the boat was small, and her parents didn't know she had grandparents, her parents, and small children. She was a child at the time, and they couldn't take everybody that they claimed. So I think they took the children, and the fishermen claimed that they would definitely get back. And it was a huge decision for her mother what to do, and so on. Well, yeah. But she did, and uh, they did get back, and uh, the parents, grandparents came on the next boat, and so on. Victor Borga is a Danish Jewish survivor. He was out of the country when the resistance actually happened. He had been entertaining in Sweden with his piano and his comedy, and he had been doing a lot of satire against the Nazis. And he was kind of on a hot list, so he couldn't get back into Denmark. And he was able to be hidden and somebody got him to the United States, and he didn't know a word of English or anything, and um, it was quite a story. And he actually showed me all around Copenhagen where he was bar mitzvahed and where his father had a food cart and where this was and that was and so on. Didn't he have a big career in America as, a, as an entertainer, a pianist, pianist, maybe a comedic? and a comedian. And, you know, I'm photo and he was always very formal, but he was very funny. And so I'm, I'm in his home, which was here in Greenwich, photographing him, and the classical music, and he's all in a coat and tie and so on, and he goes to his uh, bookshelf and finds a decoy and does that, and so on. So anyway, it has been a most interesting journey um, uh, for me. Uh, Where is the one? with the, um, oh, the mound, killing fields. The mound of human ash. Yeah. Hey. Let's That's see where that one. is. Yeah. Oh, and then they saved everything. The Nazis, they were going to build a museum, I think in Prague. Oh, yeah. And it was going to be a museum of an extinct race or something. I think that's what they called it. And so they saved all of these things. They saved everything. 
Hey. Okay, this is my Donick. This is more of the deception. People came with their one piece of luggage. They carefully labeled. They thought they would be able to get it back and get home. They stripped. They saved everything. These were crutches and yeah. Um, yeah. prosthetics? Yes, or? yes, all kinds of process prosthetics. And shoes? The shoes, the shoes, the shoes, oh. the piles of shoes. Look at the shape they're in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. In cold countries. Utensils. Okay, this is the execution wall at Auschwitz. Oh. And uh, this is done in infrared. And these are live flowers that people have put as a memorial. These are dried wreaths. And it's kind of interesting what infrared film does. It makes it all kind of ghostly and kind of glowy. And, this is actually a huge mound of human ash in an urn where there's an opening on top and the sun happened to be coming through and people had happened to had put a few carnations. live carnations uh, and the infrared picked that up and so, so this on. is in a building or this is outside? This is outside. Outside? Yeah, okay. it's, it's covered except for this one round circle on the top. And I'll end with this. This is called, Why Did the Heavens Not Darken and the Stars Not Withhold Their Radiance? Why Did Not the Sun and the Moon Turn Dark? This is from the Chronicle of Solomon Bar Simeon on the Massacre of the Jews in Mans, Germany during the First Crusade, 1096 mm -hmm. AD. So it just shows the, the history and so on of anti-Semitism. It also shows uh, Yehuda Bauer is, was a Holocaust scholar. I think he's still living, is a Holocaust scholar. He said that during this period of time, many people ask, where was God? But many other people ask, where was man? And I always like to um, quote a couple other quotes. Mm. Uh, Raoul Hilberg, also a Holocaust scholar, said during this period there were so many victims, there were so many perpetrators, and there were so many bystanders. And in our world today, which is pretty dangerous, uh, none of us can afford to be a bystander. We all have to, to go in. And early my, on. Early on, early on. And the last quote is Edmund Burke, statesman, British, I think 18th, 19th century. He said, all that it takes for evil to be victorious in our world is for enough good people to do nothing. So there are so many causes, injustices today that uh, I think a contemporary term is upstander. And it's I'm what? An oh. up, be an upstander. I don't know what that is. What uh, is it's that? the opposite of bystander. It means do oh, something. I it see It means what you do mean. something. And uh, like this wonderful Greta, Thurnberg, something yeah. like that, in Sweden, 14 yeah. years old, who has started this whole movement of young yeah. people and everyone to save our earth, our environment, our climate. Uh, uh, that's making me feel really, really, really good. And I'm hopeful that that will continue on. And uh, one last, I had discovered an underground tunnel in Theresienstadt. And so I just kind of went down and went into it. And so that's, an, that's, a, that's my shadow, and that's the tunnel. And uh, I happened to have been with a group at that time, and they couldn't find me, and so they left, <laughs> and they left me there. And, uh, uh, and they came back for me. They went on to another camp. I mean, I was like being punished. <laughs> and then came back for me, and so on. So the way it goes. Um, I was kind of on a mission of photography. And then on a personal note, this is my mom in Poland, six years old. She came over when she was like about eight years old in 1914, and she and her family. And had they not come over, they probably would have been caught in World War I, and who knows if they would have ever gotten out. So, How did you pick the pictures you put in the book versus the ones uh, that didn't make it? This book, 
well, the work goes over 30 years, but the book probably took 10 years. And that's, you know, figuring that part out, editing yes. and figuring yeah, out what to, to put in, yes. what not to put in. Um, I spent a couple years figuring out, is this two books? Do I do one on the Holocaust and one on the Danish rescue? No, decided, you know, just, uh, uh, but that took a couple years to figure that one out. And uh, it just all came together. And Aperture is unbelievable. And the, uh, the director, Chris Boot, and all of the editors and printers and everybody uh, uh, are really responsible for this whole thing coming together. So, it's always I'm a leader grateful. and an inspirer. Uh, and a team. Uh, so we want to thank Judy for sharing this with us. <laughs> thank uh, you. And we want to thank the thank team you. for showing the picture so that you can see it clearly. And um, you see that everybody has a journey to make and you can decide to share it or not. And she is sharing her journey with us. But it's the journey we all take in our own lives between good and evil. And we witness things that are at the high side and not at the high side. And as she says, be an upstander, a new word for me, because <laughs> I've never really heard that. I, uh, but early, if you don't do it early, yeah. it may be too late because your options shrink and we don't want few options. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of Judy Jones, The Spark, and thank you for the spark you brought to this. Thank you. <laughs> My goodness, this is such a pleasure. You are amazing. <laughs> well, isn't that nice of her to say? That's what you could say to people. Put a little positive energy into the world. <laughs> so remember, go out and do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know, and do it again every day, every day. And remember, smile. People have a lot on their shoulders. Thank you for tuning in, and I will see you next week. Have a beautiful week. And thank you, Judy. It's been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> to contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones The Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.